Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and care of us. And we ask for this next little while to be under your guidance and direction and the power of your Holy Spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first couple of verses of 1 Corinthians 8. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows God, knows something rather, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. So here's some pastoral advice for Paul in this chapter. But rather typically, he begins with some matters of principle, of which there are three. Knowledge puffs up with conceit but love builds up. If anyone imagines he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. If anyone loves God, he is known by God. So reducing it even more, love of brother, humility, love of God. The opening words now concerning tell us that Paul is answering a question from their letter that they've sent to him. We don't know what the question was, but it may have been, was it okay to eat in the idol house? The temples had small adjunct rooms which had a statue of the patron deity, which in Corinth may have been Poseidon, the sea god. So small groups, a dozen or so people, would celebrate birthdays and other functions. Um, the food would be dedicated to the god and it was part of everyday culture, the idol house. So was it OK or not OK for the believer to participate? Uh, the tone of Paul's uh, response suggests that the question was not hypothetical. The Greeks and the Romans loved their gods. Paul's words, God's many, Lord's many, uh, may have been a quotation of Corinth's proud slogan. The travel writer Pausanias visited Corinth a few years after Paul, and he listed temples for, wait for it, Poseidon, Aphrodite, Artemis, Isis, Dionysius, Fortune, Apollo, Heracles, Zeus, and Asclepius. So well was it said, God's many, Lord's many. At that time it was said that if you walked down the streets of Rome, you were more likely to meet a god than a man. Paul preached the gospel in five Roman provinces each one noted for its temples for the gods. Worship of the gods was deeply woven into the fabric of society, economic, social and political. Loyalty to the Caesar cult was an issue in Roman colonies like Corinth, but the Galatian cities of Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which were also Roman colonies, as well as Philippi in Macedon, another Roman colony. Antioch in Pisidia is uh, interesting from the work of archaeologists. Uh, there was a huge temple of Augustus, the emperor, in that city. It was a city where there were many retired soldiers, veterans, legionaries. And apparently within that temple, uh, there were inscriptions of the famous Reis Gestae, the uh, eulogy about himself that the Emperor Augustus wrote, and remains of the Reis Gestae have only been found in three cities, Rome, Ankara, and Antioch in Pisidia, an indication of how intensely Roman that city was. And there were numerous monuments to the great sea battle that Augustus won in 31 BC at the Battle of Actium. Also evident in those 
Galatian cities were the evidences of worship of the Phrygian moon god named Men, M-E-N, moon god. So the worship of the gods, the Caesar cult, was a huge issue for Paul wherever he went in those five Roman provinces. According to Paul, however, the worship of the gods made with hands was inexcusable. Uh, what sense is it for a higher being like a man or woman worshipping something less a piece of stone? Romans 1 indicates, according to Paul, that was anapologetos, inexcusable, stupid, you might say. And as he reminded the Thessalonians, you turned to God from idols, to serve the living and true God, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, and wait for it. Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. So worship of idolatry, of idols, and the wrath of God went together in the thinking and the preaching of Paul. So what does he mean in our passage by knowledge? Quite simply, it was the knowledge that the statues of the gods do not represent reality. Put simply, there are no gods. That's the knowledge that Paul's speaking about here. The problem Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians 8 is that a particular man, whom Paul calls a man of knowledge, believed that his knowledge, that there were no gods, gave him the right, carefully chosen word by Paul, exousia, uh, authority, entitlement, in verse 9, uh, the, the right to go to the idol house and eat the food. I guess his logic was, if there are no gods, what's the problem? Uh, what's the problem with me going there and being part of it? So for him, this man, knowledge meant freedom, absolute freedom. Presumably he would have joined happily in the Corinthian mantra, all things are lawful to me. So what had not occurred to the man of knowledge, who rightly knew that there were no gods, was the impact of his knowledge of one whom the Apostle Paul the weak brother. I presume a newish believer uh, who is not yet existentially convinced of the non-existence of the gods. So Paul writes, by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed the brother for whom Christ died. He goes on to say, and it's a kind of an oath, a vow, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Uh, it was not an empty sentiment. Uh, Paul meant these words. Um, and eating meat was a very rare privilege in those particular days, so it was quite a powerful thing to say. So it was a failure of love, love that actually knew about the weak brother and behaved in a loving way toward him. As best I can understand it, uh, the knowledge of the man of knowledge was negative knowledge. which might explain why Paul now states knowledge positively based on the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So Paul wrote, For us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. The man of knowledge is the man of knowledge's knowledge was negative, as I understand it. True, as far as it went, but incomplete. He also needed to embrace this wonderful, positive knowledge. For us, us believers, us who are brothers and sisters, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, 
through whom are all things and through whom we exist. So from this distance, as best I can understand it, the man of knowledge lacked four things. First, I think he lacked a positive knowledge of God, which I have just repeated several times. One God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ. He lacked that understanding, would appear from the passage. Secondly, he lacked humility. If anyone imagines he knows something he does not yet know, as he ought to know, the word knowledge, know, known are obviously very important in this whole passage. And he lacked love of brother. He was so puffed up, so conceited by his knowledge that he did not know his brother and was therefore incapable of building him up. Which just very briefly in passing speaks to us who are pastors or would be pastors. We really need, we really do need to know people. We really do need to know our people their stories, their struggles, their doubts, and their faith. So thirdly, love of brother, and fourthly, love for God. For me, loving God is not instinctive. Loving God responds to God's instruction to love him. So I love God because, because the Father did not spare his own son, but handed him over for us all, me included. The Father made me his son and gave me his spirit to guide me and strengthen me, direct me. The Father has provided for me, protected me. I love God because. Looking back over quite some years of ministry, I'm daily thankful for the pathway I chose, but there have been occasions of pain and hurt, sometimes down to me, but in each, the Father has carried my wife, Anita, and me through. The people of God under the Old Covenant, recited the Shema twice or three times daily. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. They needed to be reminded several times daily. So I need to be reminded to love God intentionally and thoughtfully. Paul says, if anyone loves God, he is known by God. It is as I love him that God knows me deeply and I begin to God, love God even more deeply. It is a deepening relationship. Recently, I had some plumbing work done at home. Uh, noting my great age, the young guy said to me, I'm getting married soon, any advice? I said, yep, every day, hug your wife at least three times and tell her you love her. That prompts me to think about the question of loving God and how often I should tell God I love him. So I often reflect on the Shema. It's an opportunity to recall the Father's love and care of me, my wife and our family and to express that love for God and why. Otherwise, I could go for days, weeks, before being jolted. As we love God, we are known by God, relationally, intimately, deeply, which is why he writes later, knowledge will fail, Prophecy will fail. Faith, hope and love, these three. But the greatest is love. Our loving of God is accompanied by his knowing of us. 
And when the perfect comes, we shall know God as we have been known by God. May the Lord bless us all. Amen.